when we know what the Bible says is going to come to pass, and, and these things happen, we don't go around wringing our hands and saying, the sky is falling and look what the world is coming to. We say, look who's coming to the world. Profound truth simply stated. This is Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers. You're finding 1 John, the second chapter. And when you found it, look up here and let me tell you that education is costly. But ignorance will cost you far, far more. And no child of God can afford to be ignorant in these dynamic days in which we're living. All of us have a feeling that the sands of time are running low for this generation. And most all of us feel that history as we know it is headed for a climax. Now, if that is true, time is ripe for the appearance of a person that the Bible calls the Antichrist. There is a beast of a man lurking in the shadows of history, and he's about to ready to step from the wings of the stage onto center stage. And that's what our Scripture deals with today. Now, with all of that in mind, begin to read, beginning in verse 18, Little children, it is the last time. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. I'm going to stop reading then. We're going to take up some uh, more of this chapter, and we're going to go on through the end of the chapter. But the three things I want you to learn about the time, the tyrant, and the triumph. And I want you to keep these in your mind. Now, what is the time? The time is the last days, according to verse 18. We are living in the last days, and we need to be awake. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. We're living in the last days, and we need to be awake. John says, little children, it is the last time. Literally, that may be translated and is translated in some Bibles, the last hour. Now, John said that 2,000 years ago. Adrian, if John said 2,000 years ago that it was the last time, what happened? How could it have been the last time? Because we've had two millenniums. Now, here's something you need to understand. Uh, that ever since Jesus Christ ascended into glory, it has been the last time. Now, the Old Testament, the former time, was preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ. After the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, we enter into a period of time called the last time. From the time that Jesus went up to the time that Jesus is coming back, that is the last time, that is the last hour, and any time in that interval, Jesus Christ could come. All Christians, from the time of John to this time, are to be living with the expectancy that Jesus Christ may come at any moment. So many of us have the idea that the last time is out there and we're moving toward it. No, we're living in it. Now, what I'm trying to say is that we are not living, we're not moving toward the last days, we're living on the edge of the last days. Uh, always, from the time, from the time that uh, Jesus went up uh, to the time that he's coming back, he could come at any moment. Listen, I want to show you beyond the shadow of any doubt that Jesus Christ may come at any moment. I want to give you some scriptures. Get a piece of paper and write these down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul is talking to the church at Thessalonica, and he says to them, among other things, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus told those people, or excuse me, the apostle Paul told those early Christians, wait for Jesus. Now, if, if Jesus could not have come 
And in Paul's day, that was foolish. Wait for Jesus. And the word wait is a present infinitive. That means to be constantly waiting. Philippians 3, verse 20. Paul said to the church at Philippi, For our conversation, our behavior is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior. <laughs> Those people in Philippi were to be looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he'd already come in redemption, but they were waiting for him to come in rapture. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 7. Paul told the church at Corinth, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. At Thessalonica, wait for Jesus. At Philippi, wait for Jesus. At Corinth, wait for Jesus. And then in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9 and verse 28, the writer says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Do you know what you're to be doing? You're to be learning of his coming. You're to be living for his coming. You're to be longing for his coming. And you're to be looking for his coming. You are to be expecting the Lord Jesus Christ at any moment. Paul told Titus in Titus 2 verse 13 about the grace of God that redeems us and makes us a peculiar people. And then he says, looking for that glorious appearing of, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Look for Jesus. We're not looking for some event. We're not looking for the temple to be rebuilt. We're not looking for the Antichrist to appear. We're not looking for the regathering of Israel. We're not looking for earthquakes and famines and all of these things. We're looking for Jesus. We're looking for Jesus. I'm telling you, friend, that Jesus may come before I finish this sermon. His coming is imminent. And if John said he, we're living in the last days, he was right, and so are we. Now, when he comes, he's coming suddenly. In a moment, he's coming in the twinkling of an eye. Friend, you, you say, well, I don't think it'll happen today. Well, that's a good sign that it might, for the Bible says, in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. So the first point is, the first point is, we're living in the last days. Be awake, be awake, be awake, be awake. Little children, it is the last hour in John's time, in our time, at any moment. Look! For Jesus, he's coming. He's coming at any moment. Now, if they had reason to believe he was coming in their day, how much more are we when we see these convergence of signs and coming events that cast a shadow ahead of time? If you're enjoying this message from Adrian Rogers and would like to dig a little deeper into today's topic, we'd love to send you this free companion Bible study. Use the link above to request yours. Here's the second point. Now, not only are, is, is the, is, uh, are these the last days, but number two, the Antichrist is coming and we need to be aware. The Antichrist is coming and we need to be aware. These are the last days, we need to be awake. The Antichrist is coming, we need to be aware. Look, if you will, again in verse 18 of this same chapter. And he says here, little children, it is the last time. Okay, wake up. And as ye have heard that, an, that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, there is a world ruler who is waiting in the wings, ready to step onto the center stage. I've told you that. And his name is, or his uh, title is Antichrist. Now, it's interesting to know that the Bible describes the Antichrist in many ways, but John is the only one who calls him Antichrist. The Apostle John calls him Antichrist. He has many aliases, but he has but one wicked heart. He is called the son of perdition. He is called the man of sin. He is called the wicked one. He is called the lawless one. He is called the beast. He is called the Antichrist. Put down in your margin, 2 uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 and, and verse 3. There he's called uh, the man of sin, this same one. Listen to what Paul said. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The man of sin. This man is so wicked, this Antichrist, 
that he is literally called the man of sin. That speaks of his character. Now, why does John call him the Antichrist? The word, the prefix, A-N-T-I, has two meanings. Number one, it means against, and number two, it means instead of. The same word means two different things. He is the one who comes against Christ, and how does he come against Christ? By substituting himself for Christ instead of Christ. He comes as the devil's Messiah. He comes as a diabolical, devilish substitute. He's one who opposes Christ. So put down, first of all, this Antichrist is devilish. He is devilish. The Bible says he opposes God and exalts himself above God. He is Antichrist. Jesus could say, when he was here in the flesh, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. When you've seen me, you've seen my Father. That's what Jesus could say. The Antichrist could say, when you've seen me, you have seen my Father. You see, Jesus was the visible expression of the invisible God. The Antichrist will be the visible expression of the invisible devil. As Jesus is to the Father, he will be to Satan. You see, Satan desires worship. He wants not only casualties, he wants converts. He wants that worship to be open, and he will receive it through his Messiah, the Antichrist. So put down, this Antichrist is devilish. Number two, he is divisive. Look, if you will, in verse 19 of this same chapter. He's talking now about other Antichrists, and he says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Almost all of these apostate cults began in the true church. Now, these people are not truly saved. They went out from us, but they were not of us. We see these people today, some of them maybe not leading antichrist movements, but they just fall away. Does that mean they lost their salvation? No. We say around here, the faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. <laughs> they, were, they were not of us. Had they been with us, had they been of us, had they had the Holy Spirit, they would no doubt have continued with us. What about this Antichrist? He is devilish, and the spirit of Antichrist is devilish. It is divisive. It is deceptive. Look here, if you will, in verses 20 and following. Paul says, uh, uh, John says, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things... I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Now, look in verse 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. The Antichrist is devilish. He is divisive and he is deceptive. He is a liar. He is the master liar. He learns this from his father, the devil, who is a liar and the father of it. Now, what is he going to deceive men about primarily? Who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. Friend, Antichrist is against you understanding just who Jesus is. The battle in every age, in every year, always centers on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are wrong about Jesus, it doesn't matter what you're right about. Now, folks, I want you to understand this. It, listen again. Verse uh, 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. If you're wrong about the Son, you have missed the Father. You don't understand it. Now, put in your margin 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Here's what the apostle John says in two chapters later. Beloved, believe not every spirit. You know, people say, well, I just, you know, I just have something in my heart. <laughs> Listen, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist. Where have ye have heard that it should come even now already? It is in the world. And then John wrote another epistle. 
second John. And he says in verses 7 through 11, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that ye lose not the things which ye have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now listen to this next thing. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, what doctrine? The doctrine of Christ. Receive him not into your house and neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. If somebody comes door to door visiting in your neighborhood and they want to pull off some religious literature in your house or they want to have a Bible study in your house, you find out what they believe about Jesus Christ. You find out if they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God the Son, co-equal, co-eternal with Almighty God, if He is God come in the flesh, and if they don't believe it, you can say, there's a the sidewalk, get on it. And give them a witness. Show them love. But don't you let them make your home hell's headquarters. And don't you, in a syrupy way with sloppy agape, put your arms around them and say, well, we're all headed toward the same place. That's a lie. They're not headed to heaven. Not if they don't know Jesus Christ. It's the spirit of antichrist. And what is that? He is against Christ and shows himself as a substitute for Christ. That's what antichrist means. And so this, this, this one who is coming, many antichrists are in the world, but there is one coming who is the antichrist. He is the epitome of all of it. He is the quintessential sinner and he is coming. He is the beast, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the lawless one. And the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. And he is devilish. He is divisive. Friend, he is deceptive and he's destructive. Notice here, if you will, as we continue to read, look, if you will, in verse 24 of this same uh, verse. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, Ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. The implication is that if you don't, you're going to miss eternal life. You'll be everlastingly uh, destroyed, ruined, uh, and you're going to miss Jesus. Now, everlasting life doesn't mean eternal existence. You already have that. When God made you, God breathed in your nostrils the breath of life. You became a living soul. You could no more cease to exist than God himself could cease to exist. Your soul will be in existence somewhere when the sun, moon, and stars have grown cold. You have everlasting existence. What you need is everlasting life. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. I've decided to spend it in the non-smoking section. destructive. He wants to wreck and ruin and damn your soul. He said, that's not loving. Friend, the apostle John wrote it. He's called the beloved disciple. He says, little children, it's the last time. There are many antichrists. Antichrist shall Come. And so uh, we, we see what, what John is saying. He speaks of the time. It is the last time. Be awake. He speaks of the tyrant. The Antichrist is coming. Be aware. And then thank God he speaks of the triumph. Our Lord is on his way and we need to be abiding. Awake, aware, and abiding. Now look, if you will, at, at the, uh, a new word that's going to jump out at us, and it's the word abide. Look, if you will, in verse uh, 24, and he says here in verse 24, abide, let that also therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. Look down at the end of verse 27, and even as it hath taught ye, ye shall abide in him. Now look, if you will, in verse 28, and now little children abide in him. Now, when you are <laughs> awake and when you are aware, what do you do? How do you live in the last days? Uh, well, you, you abide. Now, first of all, listen. Here's what you need to teach your children. Get ready. You need to abide in the Word of God. Again, verse 24, 
Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. He's talking about what you've heard, the Word. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. Now the word abide means to settle down, to be at home, to remain. And so let the word of God be at home in you and you at home in the word of God. Learn to appreciate the word of God. Learn to appropriate the word of God. Learn to apply the word of God. Because the way you know the Father and the Son is through the word of God. And not only do you need to abide, but parents, grandparents, you listen to me. Listen to your pastor. You need to be putting megadoses of the Word of God into the hearts and minds of your children, and they're not going to get it just in Sunday school. You're going to have to do it. You're going to have to do it. If not, they're going to get blown away. I mean, the devil is so deceptive. It's in the air like a fungus today. When our nation was founded, the Bible was the most quoted book by our founding fathers, and now it is the most banned book in America. The Bible. The most banned book in, in America. Friend, they can read almost anything in public schools except the Word of God. Now, you're mom and dad. And the Bible says in these last days, you're going to have to abide in the Word of God. Number two, you have to abide in the Spirit of God. Look in verse 27, if you will, in this same chapter. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye have need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught ye, ye shall abide in him. The Holy Spirit of God abides in you, you abide in him. But friend, you have an unction from the Holy One. You have the Holy Spirit of God who opens your understanding, who illumines you, who helps you to know, thank God for that, because the Bible says, if it were not for him, the Antichrist would deceive the very elect. Thank God that we have the Spirit of God in our hearts and you need to abide in Him so He can teach you in these last days. You see, we have an unction from the Holy One and, and, and uh, uh, we, the, the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts is there to affirm the truth. Now that doesn't mean it's just touchy-feely because it is the, the, the Spirit of God that applies the Word of God. And, and both go together to reveal the Son of God. So here's the third thing that you abide in. Look, if you will. Now, first of all, abide in the Word of God, verse 22. Uh, secondly, abide in the Spirit of God, verse 27. And finally, as a result, abide in the Son of God. Now, watch this. Verse 28. And now, little children, abide in Him, talking about Jesus, that when He shall appear, He's coming. We may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Abide in him. Abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. If the word of God abides in you and you abide in it, and if the spirit of God abides in you and you abide in him, then the son of God is going to be revealed in you and you will be at home with Jesus and Jesus will be at home with you. And when Jesus Christ comes, when Jesus Christ comes, you're not going to be alarmed. You're not going to be frightened. Uh, you're going to meet the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with anticipation and boldness and gladness. And uh, I told you about being alarmed as a boy preacher. Well, friend, I want to tell you since that time, uh, there's been a, can I use the word paradigm shift in my heart and mind? I am so longing for Jesus to get here. I don't, I don't dread his coming. You know, the early Christians had a word Maranatha, that means even so come, come Lord Jesus. I want him to come. I'm longing for him to come. I'm looking for him to come. I'm not, I'm not sick of this world. I enjoy life. I enjoy every day. But my heart beats with anticipation for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, I, I'll meet him with confidence. I don't want to be ashamed when he comes. Now, sum it up. It is the last time. Be awake. Antichrist is coming. Be aware. Our Lord is on his way. Be abiding. Abide in the Word of God. Abide in the Spirit of God. He's the inner teacher. Abide in the Son of God, so that when He appears, you'll have confidence 
and not be ashamed at his coming. Okay, bow your heads in prayer.